In the final one in our series, Phil, today I'm going to speak to you about the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now, I want you to appreciate this, that this is a massive subject. And so, for that reason, I wrote a book. So, you need to go and read the book. You need to get yourself a copy of the book, and you need to go and read the book in the book. I talk about the infilling and how it compares to what the Bible calls the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I talk about what those mean and so on. Um, and it is based on Acts chapter 13, verse 52, where Luke writes and he says, and the believers were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. The question we ask today is, what does the infilling of the Holy Spirit look like and why is, it, why is it a necessary discipline in the life of every believer? Last week we spoke about prayer. This one links to prayer. The prayer and the infilling often goes hand in hand. It is often in our prayer times that we experience the infilling of the Holy Spirit. But not always. I want to show you today that the infilling of the Holy Spirit is very practical. It is something that can be recognized and exercised any moment of our day, it doesn't have to be in, in, a, in a deep spiritual space, but it can happen throughout the day. And the infilling of the Holy Spirit is necessary. Luke says, the believers were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. In the book, Live the Third Person, I explain that there's a twofold work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. The one is that the Bible says the Holy Spirit seals our salvation. That you and I can be confident that is the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the Bible also talks about that as a baptism. Baptism into the body of Christ. We are sealed. It's like, it's like uh, putting us into that console jar and sealing that top. And we can all look out into the world and say to the devil, what are you going to do? We are sealed. We are secure. But there's another part of the work of the Holy Spirit that is the practical side of that salvation reality. It is something that happens on a daily basis and it allows us to become more like Jesus Christ. It allows us to become more spirit-filled so that we can fulfill God's purposes for our lives and be empowered to do so. And I want to focus today on the practical aspect of the infilling of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. Are you good? So, Paul writes to the Ephesians in chapter 5, and he says this to them. He talks about the infilling, and he gets very practical, um, and he says this to them. So be careful how you live. You see, just because I have the Spirit of God in me, doesn't mean I become a spiritual puppet and now I'm just sinless and I never do anything wrong because, no, no, no. Can, can I remind you that when he wrote these words, he spoke to believers, spirit-filled believers, and he says to them, be careful how you live. Every day has choices. Every day requires intention. That's why we create a legacy. It has to do with intention every day. Be careful how you live. Don't live like fools, but like those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. It says there's evil around us. Recognize every day as you wake up, Lord, help me to recognize an opportunity for your name to be glorified through my life. And to that end, fill me with your spirit, empower me, open my eyes, give me revelation. Are you with me so far? Don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. In other words, don't be guided by our natural instincts and the sinful nature. Just because something happened doesn't mean you have to get angry. 
Doesn't have to mean that you have to be upset. Listen to what the Lord has to say. That is, that is the life, the daily life of the Spirit-filled believer. By the way, can I just say this? If you don't have the Spirit of God, it is not actually possible to live like that. It is not. Then it gets very, very practical. And I'm not sure if this was a problem in the church or this is just something that came to him because it was quite prevalent in society at the time. He says, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And can I remind you that the Greek grammar that Paul uses there is written in the present continuous tense uh, from an English perspective. In other words, it actually says, be being filled. Be being filled. It's not a once-off thing. It's not just a secondary experience. It's an ongoing life experience. And then he tells us some of the things that will be the outcome of that infilling. It is not exhaustive, but here are some of the things. Singing psalms and, and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves and making music to the Lord in your hearts. I like that one. How many of you have written your own praise song lately? Just humming it in the shower. And you go, yeah, I wish Craig was here now. <laughs> just to put some, uh, some, you know, lyrics to this. Just to kind of, uh, but it'll be weird if Craig was with me in the shower. But anyway. <laughs> <coughs> so then that, that's, that, that thought just uh, departs from me. Oh. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is very interesting for me. You see, when, when I read this, I'm go, I don't, I don't think it's just, it's just not something, it's just by chance that he thought about or compared the infilling to the infilling of the infilling of the spirit to the infilling of another kind of spirit, that is alcohol. I think there's something there. So the first thing that I asked was, what does wine do to us? What does wine do to us? And so I little, did a little bit of a, a Bible study, and, and I discovered an interesting verse in Psalms, in the poetry. And the psalmist takes a moment to thank God for everything that he does. And in Psalm 104, he says this, You cause grass to grow for the livestock and plants for people to use. You allow them to produce food from the earth, wine to make them glad, olive oil to soothe their skin, and bread to give them strength. Interesting, isn't it? The psalmist says, wine is given to us by God to make us glad. Okay, now just, whoa, whoa, just, just, I can see some of you <laughs> are already panicking. Pastor Jay, where are you going with this? All right, no, 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 just, just hear me out, okay? That's what the psalmist says. Wine is given to us to make us glad. Like so many other good things that God has given us in life. How many of you know that there's a problem here, though? There's a problem here. Here's the problem. The problem is, is that so much of what God has given us to make us glad in life has been abused, out of context, and beyond healthy, disciplined moderation. And so the unfortunate thing is, is that it then gets classified often by the church as demonic. And in this context, the result, when, when something that God gives us that is good, has been abused, the result, and especially in the context of, of alcohol, Paul is saying, gladness is then exchanged for drunkenness. Instead of there be, instead of moderation, sober-mindedness, it's the same with food. How many of you love food? He says here, Bread gives us strength. Oh, my word. 
I look at some Christians and I go, you need to eat less bread. (laughs) Because it's being abused. You're abusing your body. Right? And so I think at the time, much as it is today, is that I think the reason why Paul used that example was Because in order to justify this ungodly transition from gladness to drunkenness, drunkenness has been normalized as a popular culture, even in the church. And the thing is, this is not a right versus wrong issue. We can't get legalistic about this, because that's not the point. The real issue is, How we deal with life's weariness. How we deal with our moments of emptiness. When we feel that the joy has has left the room. Moments of frustration and and anger, whatever emotion it is that we're trying to deal with. The the question is, where do we go? I think that is the question Paul asks, and that is is the distinction that he makes. He says to the church, where do you go when you are empty? Where do you go to be filled? Do you go as a spirit-filled believer? to the spirit to find your joy and your infilling or do you grab and 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 grasp the, the the very first thing that the world throws at you to bring you a temporary feeling of release and happiness which never lasts you see we all need to be recharged because we all have a tendency to go to empty Okay, it's going to get very uncomfortable. I must just warn you. Okay, just, just you see, or, already I can see in your faces like, no, I'm, I don't get empty. No, no, no. no. God has actually designed us to empty out and fill up. Empty out and fill up. Empty out. The problem is, just like if you drive a car or whatever, just like people, people push the reserves as far as they can and then they go crash somewhere. You see, you don't ever have to be on the empty, but we always have to realize that I have, I am designed, there's not even a potential that is within me, I am designed to empty out. I need to find a source of infilling. I am actually dependent on a source of infilling. Paul is saying, where do you go, Christian? when you are weary and empty for your infilling. It's part of our human design. In fact, in, in, in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus said this, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. It's an invitation. He says, you need to make a choice. You need to come to me. It's a choice you need to make. Jesus acknowledges that as human beings, we become weary and we carry heavy burdens. Where do you go to be filled up? Jesus says, come to me. The question is, which source do I choose to go to in order to be filled? Why is this question important? Because yet this is a fact. It's my first point. That which fills us consistently will eventually control us indefinitely. (laughs) If sugar fills you consistently, it will control you indefinitely. It becomes an addiction. Just like wine, just like anything else. Because we go, when we feel down, we go to that source again every day. And so that source becomes our, our place of dependence. We have a natural need for infilling. We are dependent people. I told you it's going to get 
You see, already, you see, there's something in my pride that goes, I'm not dependent on anybody. No. No, we are. Actually, we are. There is no such thing as a, a, a self-fulfilled life. You and I are not built to live in isolation and find our own point of fulfillment. It's like, it's like you, you will start consuming yourself. It's not possible. In fact, Paul explains it when he writes to the Romans in Romans 6. Look at this. He says, don't you realize that you become a slave? You become a slave of whatever you choose to obey. Whether it's a demonic power or a bowl of sugar or a loaf of bread or a site on the internet, whatever it is, but you become a slave to that which you choose to obey in obedience. When it calls you, you come. You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. Thank God, once you were slaves to sin, but now you wholeheartedly obey this teaching we have given you. Now you are free from your slavery to sin and have become free agents to righteous living. Anyway, that's how I would have liked it to be written. What is the word there? This is weird, isn't it? Because how many of you have been taught, when Jesus saves you, you're saved, completely free? No, no, it's actually an incorrect teaching. This is the correct teaching. In, in fact, in fact, if you go to the beginning of the letter that Paul wrote to the Romans, he actually starts his letter with these words. This is a letter from Paul, a slave. You see, the exchange has nothing to do with either being a slave or being free from slavery. The exchange is a deliverance from an ungodly obligation to serve the desires of our sinful nature, a life we were born into, and a life in which we had no choice. Can you see that? What happens after salvation? I am now being set free from being a slave to sin and death. Free to do what? To choose for myself who my new master would be. Who, where my new source of infilling would be. Where my new, or who or what my new higher power, if you want to call it that, would be. Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 24, he said, you can't serve two masters. Remember that? The implication of his words is this. It's not a choice whether we will serve a master or not. It's which one. So now I'm free, and I've chosen that God is my new master, but it's beautiful because he's somebody else. I am fully dependent on him just like I was to my sinful nature and, and the, the, the urges and the obligations that I needed to fulfill, but he comes to me as a father. <laughs> he embraces me as a son. And he says to me, you will not be abused by me like you were abused by sin and death. You can come sit at my table. But always remember this, that a price was paid for you. Don't get cocky. A price was paid for you. So now that the Holy Spirit is a part of my life, 
I have to now make room in my life for his presence and power. Right? The spirit want ac wants access, but my room is cluttered. So there's one part where I know that my salvation is secure, right? But now there's this journey of transformation that I walk in, and I begin to realize that the infilling of the Holy Spirit is not actually about getting more of the Spirit. Why? Because the Word of God tells me that we have be received the full measure of the Spirit. So what is the infilling about? The infilling is about uncluttering the room of my life to give him more access. And to that end, I begin to understand the infilling of the Holy Spirit is not about getting more of the Spirit. It's actually giving more of myself to the Spirit. And I love that image. Where, where's that image? Can, can you see things are fairly neat and tidy and right, you know? When, uh, when, <laughs> when, when our media team gave me that image, I said, actually what I had in mind was like a hoarder place. But then I looked at it and I thought, no, that's perfect. Because you see, that, that is what happens. I've got all my ducks in a row. Come on, my life is organized. I know I can be driven. I, I know what time I need to get up in the morning. I've got a good job. I'm sorted, everything. I've got my diary sorted. I've got a busy life. Come on, anybody know what I'm talking about? Come on, I've got that business going. I'm starting that second business. Whatever you're doing, I'm going to gym. I, my life is in order, but it lacks something. It's like empty. The spirit is not there. Or I give the Spirit a small measure on Sunday mornings. It's like a little, little hole there in that just church. There in one of those plastic folders. Maybe it's that one right under that one with the, the flowers. It's church. And the Holy Spirit's like, is, is, that, is that it? You see, Paul says this needs to happen often because every time it happens, it's a process of uncluttering. It's not just a, a moment of the spectacular where I shake or I do something. or No, it's, it's, it can happen like that, definitely. And it might even happen today like that for somebody in this place. But it's actually the most powerful spaces of the infilling is in that moment when I get angry in my day. And the Holy Spirit says to me, you're, you're about to do something foolish, like Paul says. You're, you're a spirit-filled believer, but the old sign language is coming out of you. And it's just like there's just that you, you're getting so overwhelmed with anger and frustration. Say, so can you just, can, can we exchange that emotion that's welling up within you right now? Can I exchange it for the voice of God? The infilling cannot happen unless there's an outpouring. That's why... In Ephesians 4, Paul says, Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the Spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. Put on your new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. Can you see that there cannot be a putting on? There cannot be an infilling unless there's a taking off, an outpouring, an outthrowing, a kicking out of something, someone, sometimes. <laughs> but you see, this is what we do. We go, let's see if we can have both. Come on, it's been cold, eh? How many of you have like, you know, you're like, there's really cold nights. You're like, you, you know, you, you, need to, you need to pile up the layers before you climb into bed, right? And you put that nice vest on right underneath. And then you put something else on your pajamas. And then, and in the morning you get up out of bed, it is so freezing, right? Now you know you've got to take all that stuff off. 
and you've got to put your working clothes on, and then you go, you know what, I'm just going to leave that vest on, come on. <laughs> hey, I know, you know what, it's so nice and warm around, come on, I'm just going to leave that vest on. And now, 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 now you're walking around all day long with that same vest you slept in, but you've got nice fresh clothes, and you know, you hoided the odorant and everything, and it's all good, and then you get home tonight, and it's cold again, and you take your clothes off, and that, that vest is now, it's sort of become like, like tight, and you know, like, it's become like, like nice and tight and sticky and and it's nice and you go you know what one more night come on one and you don't know, take it and you put on your pajamas go, go, I can see in your faces yeah yeah I know some of you sitting here you go <laughs> yeah it's, I'm doing that I'm doing that I've been doing it for four or three nights now that's what we want to do The Holy Spirit says, how long? How long are you still going to keep that old stuff? I want so much more of you. You've lost your joy. You're still frustrated. You're still legalistic. You don't, you don't allow the Spirit to renew your mind. Something happens and it's not perfect in your world and you just fall apart and you get angry and how can this happen? And, uh, and you just... Yes, when are you going to give that stuff to me? That hurt, that disappointment. When are you going to give it to me? It's time for an infilling. And we come for infillings and we go, Lord, just give me your joy. And, and, and nothing happens. And then we frustrate and we stop doing it. But it's in that moment when the Spirit says, I've got no room to move. I want to desperately answer your prayer. But I've got no room to move. It is time to make some sacrifices. You see, the transformation is not comfortable. The transition from drunkenness or from drunkenness to being filled with the Spirit is difficult because it implies that I have to let go of things and emotions and often people that give me a sense of security. I'm comfortable here. It's like that vest on me. I, don't, I know when I take it off, it's going to be chilly and I'm not going to feel good and I'm struggling. And the Holy Spirit says, unless you let go unless you throw off I cannot fall in it's about the space you have my full measure and I want to pour the full measure of who I am into your life but you and I have to make room and room starts with repentance so the question we ask today I'm going to ask Pastor Debbie to come up the question we have to ask today is this. Two questions. One. <laughs> where do I go when I'm weary? And what needs to change? And the second question is, if I choose the Spirit of God to fill me, how much Am I prepared to let go of in every moment? You see, he takes us on a journey. He's never going to come and say, today we're going to sweep out your whole house. He says, just give me that one corner in the room. You say, this is just today, just today. He says, there's that one thing. I've been talking to you about it for a while. Just give me that one thing. A beautiful song that he's going to share with us. And the words of the song say, do you know who's in the room with us right now? And we're going to take a moment to just reevaluate. What is it that you need to unclutter? Are you going to make space for God? Not just in these five or ten minutes here, but in your week ahead, in your daily life, in your relationships. Are you going to make space for Him? And we've also had a few people who've asked about the gift of tongues. And we're going to have an opportunity, if you desire the gift of tongues, I'm going to be up front and so will Pastor Jay. You can come forward and we'd love to pray with you. And I just want to take two minutes to tell you a little bit about the gift of tongues. Some of you have the gift of tongues. Some of you may be wondering about it. Some of you may desire it. Some of you have never even considered it. 
And I just want to read a few verses from Corinthians. And this is Paul's teaching. But before we talk about the verse, I just want to highlight the image that we've used for this series, and that is of a sponge. I want you to visualize your life like a sponge. A sponge has shape, right? And if you immerse it into water, it's still a sponge, but it's full of water. And that's what we're asking. Are you getting filled with God's Holy Spirit? Or are you getting filled with other things? And if you take that sponge out of water and you squeeze it, what's coming out of you in the week? Are you encouraging others? Are you praying for others? Are you responding with peace and with joy? Or are there other things that are coming out? Because when you're full of the Holy Spirit, you will experience that. And so we're going to take some time to fill up to fill up. And one of the things that I find is so helpful for me personally is when I spend time with God to take a few minutes to pray in tongues. And tongues is a unique gift. You can read more about it in Pastor Johan's book. It is a unique gift because it is the only one of the supernatural gifts that is for personal filling. All the others are meant to serve others. And for that reason, Paul says, and I'll show you in a moment, he says, I wish all of you could speak in tongues. And if you don't yet speak in tongues and you desire it, we're going to pray for some people today. I just want to read a few of the verses. And this is Paul speaking particularly in the context of a group meeting. But you can understand about the gift of tongues from what he's saying as he explains it. He says, let love be your highest goal. That's always our first goal. But you should also desire the special abilities the Spirit gives, especially the ability to prophesy. And he was talking specifically in a meeting. It's helpful to be able to prophesy. But he then explains, if you have the ability to speak in tongues, you will be talking only to God. Since people won't be able to understand you, you will be speaking by the power of the Spirit. But it will all be mysterious. And that's why we don't take time in our public meetings to pray in tongues. But in your private time with God, I want to encourage you to pray daily, several times a day if you can. It says, one who prophesies strengthens others, encourages them, and comforts them. And that's one of the tests of prophecy. You should be encouraged and strengthened. But that's the same thing that tongues does for you as well. It strengthens you and encourages you when you spend time with God. It says, a person who speaks in tongues is strengthened personally. And I want to encourage you, if you have the gift of tongues, pray often to be strengthened. But the one who speaks a word of prophecy strengthens the entire church. And that's why when we come together, we focus on speaking so that we can all understand. And Paul says, I wish you could all speak in tongues. But even more, I wish you could prophesy. For prophecy is greater than speaking in tongues unless someone interprets what you are saying. So the whole church will be strengthened. So when we come together, we focus on others, not just on our own need. And then in verse 14, it says, if I pray in tongues, my spirit is praying, but I don't understand what I'm saying. And so if you pray in tongues, you're like, what is this? I want to encourage you to continue praying. What you're doing is you're making space in that room to say, God, come and fill my spirit. My mind doesn't understand, but my spirit does. And for those of you that may be hesitant about it, tongues is a miracle like any other. There's a God part. And there's a man part. When Peter walked on water, it wasn't the first time he walked. He did the walking part and God did the water part. And if you desire to speak in tongues, you've got to choose to speak. And God will give you that heavenly language. And so we're going to take five or ten minutes. Craig is going to be singing a song for us. And I want to encourage you to open up your heart to receive the Spirit, to make room. Whatever it is that he's prompting you. And at the end of the song, we're going to close the meeting. And if you would like to come forward for prayer, whether it's for the gift of tongues or for any other need, you are welcome to come forward for prayer. We'll be staying in front afterwards, and I pray that you'll be blessed. Craig, won't you sing for us?
Do you know who's in the room with us right now? He's the very same God who stared death in the face, took back the keys and kicked open the grave. That's the God who's in the room with us right now. Do you know who's in the room with us, my sister? Do you know who's in the room with us right now? He's the very same God who said, let there be light. And he'll still be God when the stars cease to shine. That's the God who's in the room with us right now. He's moving. He's moving. Can you feel him moving now? Whatever supply we've seen him do miracles time after time that's the god who's in the room with us right now do you know who's in the room with us my brother do you know who's in The God who's not scared of the messes we made is waiting for us to say, Come have your way. That's the God who's in the room with us right now. All of his glory and all of his And all of his saving grace And all of his honor And all of his kindness And all of his mercy Here in this place His move He's moving. Can you feel him moving now? Whatever you need, he can supply. He's the one who does miracles time after time. That's the God who's in the room with us right now do you know who's in the room with us my brother do you know who's in the room with us right